Geico asks, how would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? Of course you would. And when it comes to great rates on insurance, Geico can help. Like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners or renters coverage. Plus, at an easy-to-use mobile app, available 24-hour roadside assistance, and more. And Geico is an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you could save. It's easy. Simply go to geico.com or contact your local agent today. Frederick is freed of his indentures to the judiciously ferocious Pirates of Penzance. What will he do with his newfound freedom? W.S. Gilbert, today on the Classic Tales Podcast. Welcome to the Classic Tales Podcast. Thank you for listening. We are proudly supported by our listeners. Many, many thanks to our financial supporters who pitch in every month to help us keep the lights on. If you enjoy the show, please sign up to be a supporter for as little as $5 a month. We'll give you a monthly coupon code for $8 off any audiobook order. Give more and you get more. Go to classictalesaudiobooks.com and become a financial supporter today. Thank you so much. And please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And if you prefer listening on YouTube, our channel is now up to date. Welcome to Pirate Summer. Our series of piratical tales continues with The Pirates of Penzance. They said it couldn't be done. They meant it probably shouldn't be done. Nevertheless, we did it you are about to hear the first installment of the audiobook version of The Pirates of Penzance. It's based on the libretto from W.S. Gilbert, of Gilbert and Sullivan fame. I've sought to keep all the original material in the libretto, and adding whatever else was necessary to make the tale a narrative rather than an operetta. I've done this treatment with plays before, but not with operettas. i found it a rare opportunity to really focus on the sharp writing of the piece, once stripped of the beloved music. There's nothing like live theater, but here's something that's a bit more portable. And now, The Pirates of Penzance, Part 1 of 2, by W.S. Gilbert. Act 1 there was a rocky seashore on the coast. There was a calm sea in the distance, on which a schooner was lying at anchor. Suddenly, from out of a cavern on the rocky seashore, which we are casually observing, a brace of pirates came out, waving their cutlasses and their flasks and cups and apparently celebrating something. Nearly all of them gathered around one named Samuel, the pirate lieutenant, with a head wrap and a hooked nose, and Samuel went around filling everyone's glasses from a flask. But not everyone was with him, for dragging his heels behind the group was Frederick, blonde and boisterous but clearly now rather despondent, and he dragged his heels behind the group, and next to him, patting his shoulder very attentively, was Ruth. She looked up, as all the pirates lifted their glasses and began singing together, Pour, oh, pour the pirate sherry! Fill, oh, fill the pirate glass! And to make us more than merry, let the pirate bumper pass! And Samuel belted out loudly, For today our pirate prentice rises from indentures freed. Strong his arm and keen his scent is, he's a pirate now indeed! And the pirates belted out, Here's good luck to Frederick's ventures, Frederick's out of his indentures. And Samuel gestured with his cup toward Frederick, and said, Two and twenty, now he's rising, and alone he's fit to fly, which we're bent on signalizing with unusual revelry. Here's good luck to Frederick's ventures, cried the pirates. Frederick's out of his indentures. Pour, oh, pour the pirate sherry. Fill, oh, fill the pirate glass. And to make us more than merry, let the pirate bumper pass and finally bringing up the end of the pirate caravan, comes the pirate king out of the cavern, 
walking strong and tall and absolutely swarthy. I'd venture to say you've never seen anything swarthier in your life than the Pirate King, with his long unruly black hair, steely eyes and open shirt, there was never anything swarthier than the pirate king across the seven seas. And he addressed his mad band of pirates. Yes, Frederick. From today, you rank as a full-blown member of our band. And all the pirates gave a resounding hurrah. All except for Frederick himself, who seemed rather despondent, bordering on moping. Frederick raised his eyes up to all of them. My friends, I thank you all from my heart for your kindly wishes. Would that I could repay them as they deserve. The pirate king saw that something was amiss and quieted everyone down and said to Frederick, I, What do you mean? Today I am out of my indentures, said Frederick, and today I leave you forever. But this is quite unaccountable, said the pirate king, amid woes of lamentations from the pirates. A keener hand at scuttling a canada, or cutting out a white star, never shipped a handspike. Yes, I have done my best for you, replied Frederick. And why? It was my duty, under my indentures. And I am the slave of duty, he went on to explain. As a child, I was regularly apprenticed to your band. It was through an error. No matter, the mistake was ours, not yours and I was in honour bound by it. An error? said Samuel. What error? And the pirates all looked around at each other, looking for clues in each other's faces, all of which remained blank and confused. But lovely, sturdy Ruth stood and came forward. I may not tell you, said Frederick. It would reflect upon my well-loved Ruth. But now Ruth spoke up for herself. Nay, dear master, my mind has long been gnawed by the cankering tooth of mystery. Better have it out at once. And Ruth stood up on a bit of a boulder, so all of the pirates could see her as she explained. When Frederick was a little lad, she said, he proved so brave and daring, his father thought he'd prentice him to some career seafaring. I was, alas, his nursery maid, and so it fell to my lot to take and bind the promising boy apprentice to a pilot. A life not bad for a hardy lad, though surely not a high lot. Though I'm a nurse, you might do worse than make your boy a pilot. I was a stupid nursery maid, on breakers, always steering, and I did not catch the word aright through being hard of hearing. Mistaking my instructions, which within my brain did gyrate, I took and bound this promising boy, apprentice to a pirate. A sad mistake it was to make, and doom him to a vile lot. I bound him to a pirate, you, instead of to a pilot. I soon found out beyond all doubt the scope of this disaster, but I hadn't the face to return to my place and break it to my master. A nursery maid is not afraid of what you people call work, so I made up my mind to go as a kind of piratical maid-of-all-work. And that is how you find me now, a member of your shy lot, which you wouldn't have found had he been bound apprentice to a pilot. Oh, pardon, Frederick, pardon! Ruth broke down into tears and grasped his knees. Rise, sweet one, said Frederick. I have long pardoned you. And he took Ruth by the hand. The two words were so much alike. They were, said Frederick. They still are, though the years have rolled over their heads. But this afternoon my obligation ceases, Frederick explained. Individually, I love you all with affection unspeakable. And the pirates grinned, many playfully punching each other on the shoulder. But collectively, Frederick said, I look upon you with a disgust that amounts to absolute detestation. And all the pirates went for their cutlasses, of course, and began to shout, Oh, pity me, my beloved friends, for such is my sense of duty that, once out of my indentures, I shall feel myself bound to devote myself heart and soul, to your extermination.
and after the maelstrom of gasps, and the pirates closed their mouths and took all this in, they began to weep. Poor lad, poor lad. They were all weeping for their slave of duty. Well, Frederick, said the pirate king, coming up to him, if you conscientiously feel that it is your duty to destroy us, we cannot blame you for acting on that conviction. Always act in accordance with the dictates of your conscience, my boy, and chance the consequences. Samuel approached rather shamefacedly. Besides, we can offer you but little temptation to remain with us, he said. We don't seem to make piracy pay. I'm sure I don't know why, but we don't. I know why, said Frederick. But alas, I mustn't tell you. It wouldn't be right. Why not, my boy? said the pirate king, looking up at the sun. It is only, squinting, half past eleven, and you are one of us until the clock strikes twelve. True, said Samuel, and until then you are bound to protect our interests. Hear, hear, cried all the pirates. Well then, said Frederick, it is my duty, as a pirate, to tell you that you are too tender-hearted. For instance, you make a point of never attacking a weaker party than yourselves, and when you attack a stronger party, you invariably get thrashed. The pirates voiced their righteous indignation at this statement, but the pirate king held up his hand. There is some truth in that. Then again, went on Frederick, you make a point of never molesting an orphan. Of course, said Samuel. We are orphans ourselves and know what it is. Yes, said Frederick, but it has got about. And what is the consequence? Everyone we capture says he's an orphan. The last three ships we took proved to be manned entirely by orphans, and so we had to let them go. One would think that Great Britain's mercantile navy was recruited solely from her orphan asylums, which we know is not the case. But hang it all, said Samuel. You wouldn't have us absolutely merciless. There's my difficulty, said Frederick in a striking pose. Until twelve o'clock I would. After twelve, I wouldn't. Was ever a man placed in so delicate a situation? And Ruth... "'Your own Ruth, whom you love so well,' said Ruth, "'and who has won her middle-aged way into your boyish heart, "'what is to become of her?' "'Oh!' said the pirate king. "'He will take you with him!' "'And the pirates cheered their assent, "'for this sounded like a very good idea to them. "'Well, Ruth,' said Frederick, "'I feel some difficulty about you. "'It is true that I admire you very much, but... I have been constantly at sea since I was eight years old, and yours is the only woman's face I have seen during that time. I think it is a sweet face. It is. Oh, it is, said Ruth. I say I think it is, said Frederick. That is my impression. But as I have never had an opportunity of comparing you with other women, it is just possible I may be mistaken. Mm, true, said the pirate king. Frederick turned to him. What a terrible thing it would be if I were to marry this innocent person, and then find out that she is, on the whole, plain. Oh, replied the pirate king, Ruth is very well, very well indeed. Yes, there are the remains of a fine woman about Ruth, said Samuel. Do you really think so? said Frederick. I do. Then I will not be so selfish as to take her from you. In justice to her, and in consideration for you, I will leave her behind. And taking Ruth by the hand, he led her to the king. But the king did not take her hand. No, no, Frederick, this must not be. We are rough men who lead a rough life. But we are not so utterly heartless as to deprive thee of thy love. I think I am right in saying that there is not one here who would rob thee of this inestimable treasure, for all the world holds dear. Not one, cried the pirates. No, I thought there wasn't, said the king. Keep thy love, Frederick, keep thy love. You're very good, I'm sure, said Frederick, and Ruth headed off in the direction of the lagoon. Well, it's the top of the tide, and we must be off, said the pirate king.
Farewell, Frederick. When your process of extermination begins, let our deaths be as swift and painless as you can conveniently make them. I will, said Frederick. By the love I have for you, I swear it. Would that you could render this extermination unnecessary by accompanying me back to civilization. No, Frederick, it cannot be, said the pirate king. I don't think much of our profession, but contrasted with respectability, it is comparatively honest. No, Frederick, I shall live and die a pirate king. And as all tough sailors do, he began to pontificate. Oh, better far to live and die under the brave black flag I fly than play a sanctimonious part with a pirate head and a pirate heart. Away to the cheating world go you where pirates all are well to do. But I'll be true to the song I sing and live and die a pirate king. For I am a pirate king. And it is, it is a glorious thing to be a pirate king. For I am a pirate king. And they all joined in. You are. Hurrah for the pirate king. And it is, it is a glorious thing to be a pirate king. And the pirates shouted, It is. Hurrah for the pirate king. Hurrah for the pirate king. And the pirate king continued. When I sally forth to seek my prey, I help myself in a royal way. I sink a few more ships, it's true, than a well-bred monarch ought to do. But many a king on a first-class throne, if he wants to call his crown his own, must manage somehow to get through more dirty work than e'er I do. For I am a pirate king, and it is, it is a glorious thing to be a pirate king. For I am a pirate king. And the pirates joined in, You are! Hurrah for the pirate king! And it is, it is a glorious thing to be a pirate king. It is! Hurrah for the pirate king! Hurrah for the pirate king! And the pirates lifted him on their shoulders and carried him off to the dinghy, where they all headed back to their ship. Frederick smiled and waved and turned away from them, and headed off in the direction of the lagoon himself. Ruth caught up to him. Oh, take me with you! I cannot live if I am left behind. Ruth, said Frederick, I will be quite candid with you. You are very dear to me, as you know, but I must be circumspect. You see, you are considerably older than I. A lad of twenty-one usually looks for a wife of seventeen. A wife of seventeen? said Ruth. You will find me a wife of a thousand. No, but I shall find you a wife of forty-seven, said Frederick, and that is quite enough. Ruth, tell me candidly and without reserve, compared with other women, how are you? I will answer truthfully, master, said Ruth. I have a slight cold, but otherwise I am quite well. I am sorry for your cold, said Frederick, but I was referring rather to your personal appearance. Compared with other women, are you beautiful? Ruth smiled and batted her long lashes, and very coyly said, I have been told so, dear master. Ah, said Frederick, but lately? Oh, no, years and years ago, said Ruth. What do you think of yourself? It is a delicate question to answer, but I think I am a fine woman, said Ruth. That is your candid opinion? Yes. I should be deceiving you if I told you otherwise. And she pinched his cheek. Thank you, Ruth, said Frederick. I believe you, for I am sure you would not practice on my inexperience. I wish to do the right thing. And if, I say if, you are really a fine woman, your age shall be no obstacle to our union. And he shook hands enthusiastically with her. But suddenly... A chorus of girls was heard in the distance, twittering something about climbing over rocky mountains, etc. Hark! Surely I hear voices, said Frederick. Who has ventured to approach our all but inaccessible lair? Can it be Custom House? No, it does not sound like Custom House. Ruth, the thoughts in her mind gyrating again, said to herself, Confusion! It is the voices of young girls! If he should see them, I am lost! 
Frederick climbed up on the boulder and looked off and saw. He saw for the first time a bevy of beautiful maidens. By all that's marvellous, a bevy of beautiful maidens. Lost, 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 said Ruth to herself. Frederick pulled out his spyglass and had a closer look. How lovely, how surpassingly lovely is the plainest of them. What grace, what delicacy, what refinement. And Ruth, Ruth told me she was beautiful. And he slammed his spyglass shut, spun around and pointed the finger of derision. Oh, false one, you have deceived me. I have deceived you, said Ruth. Yes, deceived me, said Frederick, slowly walking down from his boulder. You told me you were fair as gold. And master, am I not so, said Ruth wildly. And now I see you're plain and old. I'm sure I'm not a jot so. Upon my innocence you play. I'm not the one to plot so. Your face is lined, your hair is grey. It gradually got so. Faithless woman to deceive me, I who trusted so, said Frederick. Master, master, do not leave me. Hear me ere you go, said Ruth. My love without reflecting, oh, do not be rejecting. Take a maiden tender, her affection raw and green, at very highest rating, has been accumulating summers seventeen. Summers seventeen. Don't, beloved master, crush me with disaster. What is such a dower to the dower I have here? My love, unabating, has been accumulating forty-seven year. Forty-seven year. And Ruth and Frederick began to speak over the top of each other. Don't, beloved master, yes, your former master, crush me with disaster, saves you from disaster. What is such a dower to the dower I have here? Your love would be uncomfortably fervid, it is clear. My love, unabating, if, as you are stating, has been accumulating, it's been accumulating, forty-seven year, forty-seven year, forty-seven year. Forty-seven year, faithless woman to deceive me, I who trusted so. Master, master, do not leave me, hear me ere I go. But Frederick will hear no more, and standing tall and pointing again the finger of derision, motioning for her to leave him forever. Faithless woman to deceive me, I who trusted so. And Ruth gathered up her things, smacked him with her bag, and left him to his youthful ways. And Frederick, alarmed and alone, and in the company of maidens, said to himself, What shall I do? Before these gentle maidens, I dare not show in this alarming costume. No, no, I must remain in close concealment until I can appear in decent clothing. And he went and hid in the cave, as maidens trickled in from everywhere, over rocks, through the bushes, all around, they all came closer to the lagoon, and they sang a song as they came. Climbing over rocky mountain, skipping rivulet and fountain, passing where the willows quiver, passing where the willows quiver, by the ever-rolling river, swollen with the summer rain, the summer rain, threading long and leafy mazes, dotted with unnumbered daisies, dotted, dotted with unnumbered daisies, scaling rough and rugged passes, Climb the hardy little lasses till the bright seashore they gain. Scaling rough and rugged passes, climb the hardy little lasses till the bright seashore they gain. The tallest of them, Edith by name, spoke up. Let us gaily tread the measure and make the most of fleeting leisure. Hail it as a true ally, though it perish by and by. Hail it as a true ally, though it perish by and by repeated the girls. Every moment brings a treasure of its own especial pleasure, said Edith. Though the moments quickly die, greet them gaily as they fly, greet them gaily as they fly. Though the moments quickly die, greet them gaily as they fly, 
said the girls. Far away from toil and care, reveling in fresh sea air, here we live and reign alone in a world that's all our own, said Kate with the brightest eyes. Here, in this our rocky den, far away from mortal men, we'll be queens and make decrees. They may honor them who please. We'll be queens and make decrees. They may honor them who please. Let us gaily tread the measure, etc., etc., said the girls. What a picturesque spot. I wonder where we are, said Kate. And I wonder where Papa is, said Edith. We have left him ever so far behind. Oh, he will be here presently. Remember, poor Papa is not as young as we are, and we came over a rather difficult country. But how thoroughly delightful it is to be so entirely alone, said Kate. Why, in all probability, we are the first human beings who ever set foot on this enchanting spot. Except the mermaids. It's the very place for mermaids, said Isabel. Who are only human beings down to the waist, said Kate. And who can't be said strictly to set foot anywhere, said Edith. Tails they may, but feet they cannot. "'But what shall we do until Papa and the servants arrive with the luncheon?' said Edith. "'We are quite alone, and the sea is as smooth as glass. "'Suppose,' said Edith, "'we take off our shoes and stockings and paddle.' "'Yes, yes,' they all shouted, "'the very thing!' "'They prepared to carry out the suggestion. "'They had all taken off one shoe when Frederick couldn't stand it any longer.' and came to the front of the cave. Stop, ladies, pray, he said. A man, said the girls, all hopping on one foot. Frederick explained himself. I had intended not to intrude myself upon your notice, in this effective but alarming costume. But under these peculiar circumstances, it is my bounden duty to inform you that your proceedings will not be unwitnessed. "'But who are you, sir? Speak!' said Edith, still on one foot. "'I am a pirate,' said Frederick. "'A pirate? Horror!' said the girls, still hopping, some tumbling over at this news. "'Ladies, do not shun me,' said Frederick. "'This evening I renounce my vile profession. "'And to that end, O oh pure and peerless maidens,' O blushing buds of ever-blooming beauty, I, sore at heart, implore your kind assistance. How pitiful his tale, said Edith. How rare his beauty, said Kate. How pitiful his tale, how rare his beauty, repeated all the girls. Frederick took several steps toward them and began to sing. Oh, is there not one maiden breast which does not feel the moral beauty of making worldly interest subordinate to sense of duty, who would not give up willingly all matrimonial ambition to rescue such a one as I from his unfortunate position? From his position, to rescue such an one as I from his unfortunate position position. Alas, said the girls, there's not one maiden breast which seems to feel the moral beauty of making worldly interest subordinate to sense of duty. Oh, said Frederick, is there not one maiden here whose homely face and bad complexion have caused all hope to disappear of ever winning man's affection? Of such a one, if such there be, I swear by heaven's arch above you, if you will cast your eyes on me, however plain you be, I'll love you. However plain you be, if you will cast your eyes on me, however plain you be, I'll love you. I'll love you. I'll love you. I'll love you. Alas, said the girls, snapping out of it, snapping out of all of it. There's not one maiden here whose homely face and 
bad complexion have caused all hope to disappear of ever winning man's affection. Not one? asked Frederick in despair. No, no, not one. Not one? No, no. Yes, one, said Maybell, coming through the arch of stone. Yes, one. Ah, tis Maybell! Tis Maybell. And Maybell decided to come and scold her sisters. Oh, sisters, deaf to pity's name, for shame. It's true that he has gone astray, but pray, is that a reason good and true why you should all be deaf to pity's name? And the girls all rolled their eyes and said, The question is, had he not been a thing of beauty, would she be swayed by quite as keen a sense of duty? For shame, for shame, for shame, said Maybelle, and she turned to Frederick. Poor wandering one, though thou hast surely strayed, take heart of grace, thy steps retrace, poor wandering one, poor wandering one. If such poor love as mine can help thee find true peace of mind, why, take it. It is thine. Take heart, said the girls. No danger lowers. Take any heart but ours. Take heart. Fair days will shine, said Maybelle. Take any heart. Take mine. Take heart, said the girls. No danger lowers. Take any heart but ours. Take heart. Fair days will shine, said Maybelle. Take any heart, take mine, poor wandering one, and more variations on that theme. Frederick and Maybelle went to the mouth of the cave to converse together. They had serious plans to discuss. Edith beckoned her sisters to form a semicircle around her. What ought we to do, gentle sisters? Say, propriety, we know, says we ought to stay, while sympathy exclaims, Free them from your tether. Play at other games. Leave them here together. Kate chimed in. Her case may any day be yours, my dear, or mine. Let her make her hay while the sun doth shine. Let us compromise. Our hearts are not of leather. Let us shut our eyes and talk about the weather. The girls all agreed. Yes, yes, let's talk about the weather and falling into their role of group chaperone, they began to say very quickly, How beautifully blew the sky, the glass is rising very high. Continue fine, I hope it may, and yet it rained but yesterday. Tomorrow it may pour again, I hear the country wants some rain. Yet people say, I know not why, that we shall have a warm July. Tomorrow it may pour again, I hear the country wants some rain. Yet people say, I know not why, that we shall have a warm July. And the girls continued to chatter and chatter about the weather, but got quieter and quieter, so that we could hear what Maybelle and Frederick were saying. Maybelle said, Did ever maiden wake from dream of homely duty, to find her daylight break with such exceeding beauty? Did ever maiden close her eyes on waking sadness, to dream of such exceeding gladness? Ah, yes, said Frederick. Ah, yes, this is exceeding gladness and Frederick looked at the girls, who continued their chattering about the beautifully blue sky. He spoke to Maybell. Did ever pirate roll his soul in guilty dreaming, and wake to find that soul with peace and virtue beaming? And Frederick and Maybell and the girls all sang together, on top of one another, the same things kind of over and over again, until finally Frederick brought them back to reality. Stay! We must not lose our senses. Men who stick at no offences will anon be here. Piracy their dreadful trade is. Pray you, get you hence, young ladies, while the coast is clear. And Frederick and Maybelle ran off. The girls, agreeing, also said, No, we must not lose our senses. If they stick at no offences, we should not be here. Piracy their dreadful trade is. Nice companions for young ladies. Let us disap... But suddenly... Pirates, who have been sneaking in stealthily all around them this whole time, jumped out of their hiding places and formed a semicircle behind the girls. As each maiden tried to run away, they were seized by a pirate. Every pirate seized a maiden. And the girls screamed out, Too late! Too late! And the pirates simply chuckled, Ha ha ho ho! Ha 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 ho ho ho!
the pirates proclaimed, Here's a first-rate opportunity to get married with impunity and indulge in the felicity of unbounded domesticity. You shall be quickly personified, conjugally matrimonified, by a doctor of divinity who is located in this vicinity. By a doctor of divinity who resides in this vicinity. By a doctor, a doctor, a doctor of divinity of divinity. And the girls all sang, We have missed our opportunity of escaping with impunity. So farewell to the felicity of our maiden domesticity. We shall quickly be personified, conjugally matrimonified, by a doctor of divinity who is located in this vicinity, by a doctor of divinity who resides in this vicinity, by a doctor, a doctor, a doctor of divinity of divinity. And as the pirates were preparing to carry off the ladies, Maybell came forward. Hold, monsters! Ere your pirate caravanserai proceed against our will to wed us all, just bear in mind that we are wards in chancery, and father is a major general. Samuel's eyes grew wide, and he said, We'd better pause, or danger may befall. Their father is a major general. Yes, yes, he is a major general, said the girls. And suddenly appearing on a rock, having entered unnoticed, was an elderly gentleman in a pith helmet and tweeds. Yes, yes, I am a major general. For he is a major general, said Samuel. He is, they all said. Hurrah for the major general. And it is, it is a glorious thing to be a major general. It is, they all agreed. Hurrah for the major general. Hurrah for the major general. And the major general continued. I am the very model of a modern major general. I've information vegetable, animal, and mineral. I know the kings of England, and I quote the fights historical, from Marathon to Waterloo in order categorical. I'm very well acquainted, too, with matters mathematical. I understand equations, both the simple and quadratical. About binomial theorem, I'm teeming with a lot of news. A lot of news. I got it. With many cheerful facts about the square of the hypotenuse. And everyone cheers with many cheerful facts about the square of the hypotenuse, etc. The Major General continued. I'm very good at integral and differential calculus. I know the scientific names of beings animalculus. In short, in manners vegetable, animal, and mineral, I am the very model of a modern major general. And everyone agreed. In short, in manners vegetable, animal, and mineral, he is the very model of a modern major general. The major general continued. I know our mythic history, King Arthur's, and Sir Caradox. I understand hard acrostics. I've a pretty taste for paradox. I quote in elegiacs all the crimes of Heliogabalus. In conics I can floor peculiarities parabolus. I can tell undoubted Raphaels from Gerard Dow's and Zophanes. I know the croaking chorus from the frogs of Aristophanes. Then I can hum a fugue of which I've heard the music's dinner for. Dinner for. Got it. And whistle all the airs from that infernal nonsense pinafore. And everyone agreed this is marvellous, and repeated several times, and whistle all the airs from that infernal nonsense pinafore. Then I can write a washing bill in Babylonic cuneiform, and tell you every detail of Caractacus's uniform. In short, in matters vegetable, animal, and mineral, I am the very model of a modern major general. Is there more? Of course there's more. In fact, when I know what is meant by mamelon and ravelin, when I can tell at sight... A mauser rifle from a javelin. When such affairs as sorties and surprises I'm more wary at, and when I know precisely what is meant by commissariat. When I have learned what progress has been made in modern gunnery. When I know more of tactics than a novice in a nunnery. In short, when I have a smattering of elemental strategy. Yeah, strategy. That's a hard one, isn't it? I got it. You'll say a better major general has never sat a G. What's that, then? Rode a horse. What's that? You'll say a better major general has never rode a horse. Well, let's sing that a few times over. And the major general continued. For my military knowledge, though I'm plucky and adventury, has only been brought down to the beginning of the century, but still in matters vegetable, animal, and mineral, I am the very model of a modern major general. And everyone agreed, but still, in matters vegetable, animal, and mineral, he is the very model of a modern major general. 
and after all that great fun and everyone's patted each other on the back and congratulated themselves, the Major General continued. And now that I've introduced myself, I should like to have some idea of what's going on. Oh, Papa, we... But Samuel stepped in front of Kate. Permit me, I'll explain in two words. We propose to marry your daughters. Dear me. Against our wills, Papa, against our wills, the girl said. Oh, but you mustn't do that, said the general. May I ask, this is a picturesque uniform, but I'm not familiar with it. What are you? We are single gentlemen, said the Pirate King. Yes, I gathered that, but anything else? No, nothing else, said the King. Papa, don't believe them. They are pirates, said Edith, the famous pirates of Penzance. The pirates of Penzance? I've often heard of them. But Maybell brought Frederick forward. All except this gentleman, who was a pirate once, but who is out of his indentures today, and who means to lead a blameless life evermore. But wait a bit, said the general. I object to pirates as sons-in-law. We object to major generals as fathers-in-law, said the pirate king, and the pirates shouted their approval. But we waive that point, said the pirate king. We do not press it. We look over it, the Major General said to himself, Ha ha, an idea. And aloud he said, And do you mean to say that you would deliberately rob me of these, the sole remaining props of my old age, and leave me to go through the remainder of my life unfriended, unprotected, and alone? Well, yes, that's the idea, said the Pirate King. Tell me, said the General. Have you ever known what it is to be an orphan? Oh, all the pirates are absolutely disgusted. Oh, dash it all. Here we go again, said the Pirate King. I ask you, continued the General, have you ever known what it is to be an orphan? The Pirate King said, Orphan. Yes, often. Have you ever known what it is to be one? I say often. The pirates, all disgusted, repeated, Often, 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 and turned away. <laughs> I don't think we quite understand one another, said the general. I ask you, have you ever known what it is to be an orphan? And you say orphan. As I understand you, you are merely repeating the word orphan to show that you understand me. I didn't repeat the word orphan, said the pirate king. Pardon me, you did indeed. I only repeated it once. True, but you repeated it, but not often. <laughs> Stop, said the general. I think I see where we are getting confused. When you say orphan, did you mean orphan, a person who has lost his parents, or orphan frequently? Ah, I beg your pardon, said the pirate king. I see what you mean. Frequently. Ah, you said often frequently. No, only once. <laughs> exactly, said the general. You said often frequently, only once. The general decided to put his case another way. O oh, men of dark and dismal fate, forego your cruel employ. Have pity on my lonely state. I am... An orphan boy. An orphan boy, said the pirate king and Samuel. An orphan boy. How sad. An orphan boy, said the pirates. The general gestured to all his wonderful children. These children whom you see are all that I can call my own. Poor fellow, said the pirates. Take them away from me, and I shall be indeed alone. Poor fellow, said the pirates. If pity you can feel, leave me my sole remaining joy. See, at your feet they kneel. Your hearts you cannot steal against the sad, sad tale of the lonely orphan boy. Poor fellow said the pirates, 
who began to sob in their piratical way. See at our feet they kneel. Our hearts we cannot steal against the sad, sad tale of the lonely orphan boy. The orphan boy, said Samuel. The orphan boy, said the pirate king. See at our feet they kneel. Our hearts we cannot steal against the tale of the lonely orphan boy. Poor fellow, said the pirates. And then three things happened at the same time. The general, the girls, and the pirates all began talking at once, basically to themselves. The general said, I'm telling a terrible story, but it doesn't diminish my glory, for they would have taken my daughters over the billowy waters. If I hadn't in elegant diction indulged in an innocent fiction, which is not in the same category as a regular terrible story. And the girls, who knew what their father was doing, sang a version of the same thing. But the pirates said to themselves, If he is telling a terrible story, he shall die by a death that is gory. Yes, one of the cruelest slaughters that were ever known in these waters. It is easy in elegant diction to call it an innocent fiction, but it comes in the same category as telling a regular terrible story. And the pirate king, who still had tears streaming down his cheeks, approached the major general. Although our dark career sometimes involves the crime of stealing, we rather think that we are not altogether void of feeling. Although we live by strife, we're always sorry to begin it. For what, we ask, is life without a touch of poetry in it? And everyone knelt and gazed to the heavens and sang, Hail Poetry! Thou heaven-born maid, thou gildest e'en the pirate's trade. Hail, flowing fount of sentiment, all hail, all hail, divine emollient. And after a collective gasp, they all got to their feet again and looked at one another. The pirate king said, You may go, for you're at liberty. Our pirate rules protect you and honorary members of our band, we do elect you. For he is an orphan boy, said Samuel, and everyone agrees, he is, hurrah for the orphan boy. And it sometimes is a useful thing to be an orphan boy. It is, everyone agrees, hurrah for the orphan boy, hurrah for the orphan boy. And the cheerful sentiment continued, and everyone sang, O oh, happy day, with joyous glee, they will away and married be. Should it befall auspiciously, our sisters all will bridesmaids be. Then suddenly from the motley group of pirates appeared Ruth. She pulled Frederick aside. Oh, master, hear one word, I do implore you. Remember Ruth, your Ruth who kneels before you. Yes, yes, said the pirates. Remember Ruth who kneels before you. Away, you did deceive me, said Frederick. Away, you did deceive him, said the pirates. Oh, do not leave me. Oh, do not leave her. Away, you grieve me. Away, you grieve him. I wish you'd leave me, said Frederick, and cast Ruth from him. We wish you'd leave him, said the pirates. Then everyone began singing versions of Pray observe the magnanimity we display to lace and dimity. Never was such opportunity to get married with impunity. But we give up the felicity of unbounded domesticity though a doctor of divinity is located in this vicinity. See, the pirate said, we did it, but the women said they did it, but it's basically the same thing. But then the pirates indulged in a wild dance of delight. The major general produced a British flag, and the pirate king, in the arched rock over by the lagoon, produced a black flag with skull and crossbones. And once more, we saw Ruth appear, who made a final appeal to Frederick, who cast her from him, seemingly, forever. This is B.J. Harrison. I hope you've enjoyed this unabridged production of The Pirates of Penzance, Part 1 of 2, by W.S. Gilbert. If you've enjoyed this book, please become a monthly supporter by going to ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com. 
donate $5 a month and get a monthly coupon code for $8 off anything in the store. Give more and you get more. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you for joining me today and allowing classic literature to awaken your better self. Please join me every week and we'll rediscover the greatest stories ever put to paper.